Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Gavin Williams. I'm the multi-channel e-commerce consultant at Harvey Nichols. And I'm Daryl Lady. I'm the managing director of Ampersand Commerce, Harvey Nichols' lead development partner for their e-platform. So by way of an introduction to Harvey Nichols, for those that you don't know uh, what it is, um, we'll start off with a quick video. Okay, so um, Harvey Nichols is a luxury department store um, based out in the UK, but with um, operations in the Middle East uh, and Hong Kong. What's um, impressed me most about this uh, conference so far is, you know, no matter who I've seen to have talked to or bumped into, even though we work across different sectors, the issues that we face are very similar. So we've just come off the back of a two and a half year multi-channel change program at Harvey Nichols, um, culminating in a relaunch of the website about four weeks ago. I think it's fair to say that over that period of time, every system that's touched a process for multi-channel has either been rewritten, redeveloped, or thrown out of the window. In common with many bricks and mortar retailers, Harvey Nichols found this transition to e-commerce and beyond full of fantastic opportunities, but also great challenges. Um, you know, we got a lot of things right over the last couple of years, but you know, it's fair to say we got a few things wrong too. So we don't have any answers for you today, uh, and I'm not certainly trying to sell you anything. I can't say the same for Daryl. Um, but I think what we want to do is give you some tangible examples of the challenges we faced and some of the solutions we put in place to, um, to meet them. So I just want to start just by looking briefly at multi-channel and what Harvey Nichols means or what multi-channel means to Harvey Nichols. So you'll all be pretty familiar with the different touch points that's been talked about everywhere. Um, but for Harvey Nichols, really the key areas of multi-channel are, are what touches the customer experience. So in terms of the multi-channel replatform project for Harvey Nichols, we were most concerned with browsing, buying, returning, and pre- and post-sales service. And they're absolutely crucial parts of the journey for a luxury customer. So I just want to give a little bit of context for the non-UK audience in terms of some of the decisions that we made for the project um, and the landscape in the UK and why, why, why we've done things the way that we have. So if you look at Click and Collect as a service in the UK, the adoption and the usage of that has gone from 39% in Christmas 2012 to 79% in 2013. So that's a massive shift in usage of, of delivery methods for, for, for retailers. And actually, it gives bricks and mortar retailers like Harvey Nichols a massive competitive advantage. So the, the click and collect played a real, really big part in the, the program of what we did for the replatform. Um, and it also culminated in kind of the invention of a, of a new service as well, really targeted at luxury customers. From a technology point of view, we, we had to focus on two things. Obviously, we had to focus on the Magento platform rebuild, but we also had to look at two central pieces of technology and functionality that without, we would not be able to deliver on the needs of Harvey Nichols. So, that, so they, the first was a single view of stock. 
So as with any luxury retailer, Harvey Nichols buys quite shallow on their products. They have expensive items that sell relatively few units. They're disparate and they're spread all over the country in the UK. So Harvey Nichols required a single view of stock across their whole business that gives customers on the website a real-time view of where items are anywhere in their estate. The second one was to try and build a single view of the customer. So we're using in-store data to drive online experiences, but we're also trying very hard to use the online data that we're able to gather to build better customer experiences in-store as well. So as part of the project, we're able to give style advisors in-store access to the, the customer buying history, the brand preferences, and the information that the customer has given to us through their account in order to drive better experiences in store and actually do one-to-one -one personalization with a style assistant. So Gavin's going to look at some of the business challenges um, for Harvey Nichols in trying, to, in trying to make those things happen. Thanks. So before we talk about complexities of integrations or solutions, I think it's probably crucial for all of us in the room to recognize the business environment we work in. There, there are a number of things that I think that help and restrict us in terms of developing a multi-channel or omni-channel program. The first one of these is insight. Um, you know, it's said that often that, that you can only make informed decisions based on the information you have at that particular given moment in time. That's kind of quite not good enough for the work that we do and the area we work in. Um, much of the information that we require is dependent on the systems that we've yet to build. It's almost a catch-22. Our insight can be limited. If we're embarking on a multi-channel journey, we may not have that link between store and website. We can't make those decisions based on data we don't know. So we have to take leaps of faith quite often. Technology. Um, I think we probably all share this, and certainly those retailers in the room. Sometimes we feel that the multi-channel solutions are dictated by systems and processes, when of course what we'd like them to be dictated to is our customer journeys that we've defined. We're often restricted by the technology available to us. That's a business reality. Our job on our roadmap is to ensure over time that we transition through to the technologies we need. We also forget, guys, that you know, e-commerce is a nascent technology. Um, you know, nothing's really commoditized in what we want to do. We can't buy stuff off the shelf like we'd like to in other sectors. Um, the conversations I've had with a lot of you over the last few days have started with what technology can you recommend for X, or I'm having a real problem with a deployment with Y. We're not at a stage yet where we can confidently take a, uh, and plug and play technologies that we need. Ever-changing requirements. Um, I'm not talking about scope creep here. That's kind of up to the project managers and the business owners to control. It's almost this, um, this subconscious thing that's inherent in our in industry. You know, I, I don't know about you guys, but often I go to bed having you know, frequent nightmares about the number of choices that I have available to me. But our job as kind of leaders in this sector is to say, look, you know, this industry is constantly marketing us with solutions, and sometimes solutions for problems that don't exist. One of the things I think that we all need to do is ensure that when we're making decisions, that we make them really based on our business needs, not because the industry is telling us to go in a certain direction. And lastly, it's talent. Um, it's tough still. So, you know, all the great ideas in the world mean nothing without execution. Um, you know, identifying, hiring, retaining talent remains tough. We've, we're still in a market where demand is outstripping supply. It's a key challenge for us. So, you know, I, I did add at the end of this late last night actually was something about culture. Um, changing culture is is something that's really tough. It's change management, and when you're trying to shift business paradigms like we're trying to do with multi-channel and omni-channel. It, it is tough. Um, what we're trying to say there is, like, like, let's, let's think of a tangible example. Let's talk about the, um, the sales assistant who's getting rewarded in store for, that was, that was one of my employees. <laughs> ah, it's you, out. Um, <laughs> the, the sales assistant who's in store is getting rewarded for a number of sales they're pushing through the till. But it's still the conversations I have with, with retailers where they haven't bridged that gap between, well, if they're pushing additional sales through the internet, let's say that stock's been found from a different location somewhere else, that that's not counted as their sale. 
That's a crazy conversation to have. The business doesn't care about it. Now, I often think that's something for the financial directors to, um, to solve the problem of, but, but let's, not, um, let's not beat up the bean counters today. There are also sector challenges, aren't there? So again, returning to this theme of um, what we have in, in this room, and certainly in this conference, is enormous diversity of the types of products and sectors we operate in. Luxury has its own challenges, and there's three of those that I want to highlight. So premium service, it's, it's not enough for you to sell that 10,000 pound item. You have to deliver it beautifully. You have to create a sense of real experience, and that's something you can do offline really easily through people, harder to do online, and it's one of the challenges we have. Scarcity, luxury is not just about expense, it's about the perception that that item has got a limited shelf life. It's not gonna be available all the time. You have to act quickly. Scarcity for us creates a challenge on stock. As Daryl alluded to, for us that's, we don't have endless cans of baked beans sitting in a warehouse that can be replenished. It doesn't work that way. So our ability to move small volume to stock across the country, across territories is massively important. Brand expectations. When you're a multi-brand retailer, you have to also deal with the expectations of the brands you sell. And in luxury, there are a lot of conditions that they put on you for you to sell their goods. This is a good thing. This is them giving their experience. In store, this is what we might call the concession experience. They take an element of your store, they staff it, they train their people, in many instances, collect their own data. Online, they want to do the same thing. So you have to have a very adaptive and responsive approach, and I don't mean anything to do with design there, on how you deal with these concession partners and their expectations. So meeting those challenges. Let's talk a little bit about Magento. Um, it's difficult, a, a, a technology conference effectively, not to say, to say this, but we have to. Look, it's this partnership first, i.e. customer first, technology second. I think the guilty thing we might have is putting technology right at the heart of the decision versus actually bringing it through and saying, we need to certain objectives for our business, what technologies based, uh, most meet those needs. Now, when we went to market, there are a number of things that I thought were important. Magento for us is a pretty thin layer. So we don't need it to do lots of bells and whistles. What we want Magento to be is a performing, scalable solution, great uh, promotions engine, something that has proven experience of good integrations. That's what we want out of an e-commerce platform. For us at this stage, for Harvey Nichols in particular, agency fit was crucial. Um, and again, um, it's very easy when, when you're doing an RFP process and a, a selection process that you can have lots of things ticked. But what I need to do is I need to look at people and understand the customer, understand where we need to get. I didn't want a cookie cutter website. Lastly, about masters of own destinies, Again, we took this journey uh, with advice from a, you know, quite a lot of partners on we want to be master of our own pain. And that's kind of a way of suggesting that actually we want our own development over time. Okay, Magento gives us that option to do that. There weren't any other platforms that we were looking at that did. So then the next step was how do we take those requirements and, and build them from a systems point of view to enable those using the Magento platform as the center and the website? So in terms of the three key integration areas, there are others, but these are the, the three central ones. The, firstly, we looked at a, a centralized PIM solution, which uh, looks at merchandise product and information across the whole Harvey Nichols business. The second was um, the CRM system, which gives us a single view of the customer, and it allows us to um, see the segments and the brand preferences of customers across the whole business and to start to build relevant um, customer experiences um, this is particularly relevant for VIP customers. So Harvey Nichols have a very small segment of VIP customers who, who get exceptional service, and, it's, and we use the CRM as a way of identifying those people and, and the selling to them. The final one I want, to, I, want to, I want to give an example of, which is the ERP system, which is the single view of stock, which I talked about earlier. So as part of this project, one of the key things that we did was to, was to build a single view of every item in every part of the, of, of the business. And from a customer point of view, what that actually enables us to do was to give customers real-time information about the availability of product and delivery services anywhere in the business. So in this example, we see a dress here that, and this is within the Knightsbridge store in London. It shows the customer that they can visit the store and look at the item today. 
It's available for standard and express delivery. They can also do click and, click and collect, and they can also do the new click and try uh, service as well, which we'll, which we'll cover in a minute. But that was only possible based on having real-time information across the whole business and using a real-time integration with Magento to do that. Okay, so let's talk about um, persona scenarios. Um, in, in the past, I've been a bit uh, doubtful, even a, a tad cynical about personas. I think if you take it a step forward, you can get some real value. So in this instance, um, we're trying to find in our customer group personas that dictate customer journeys, that can say, actually, how can we take that then and create developments around them? So in this example, we have, let's call her Miss Go Lightly. So she's a fashionista. She's a magazine editor living in East London. She's got a fashion blog, attends shows, considered a key influencer. She's a frequent purchaser of fashion, both online and offline. And although she's brand loyal, she's not retail loyal. So our scenario with this type of customer is they're important to us, so what do we do? So Miss Go Lightly comes into the store via personal shopping, um, a personal shopper, and tries on a dress. She tries on a pair of shoes, tries on a handbag. These are high value item goods with a personal touch. She buys that dress, but she's not sure about the shoes and she's not sure about the handbag, so she leaves them behind. So that what we want there is the, the system to allow that personal shopper to say, well, hang on a minute, when she gets home and she tries that dress on, she might be, have a bit of FOMO moment and say, I really want that bag, I really want those shoes. So what we developed here is the ability of the personal shopper to go into the back office, create a shortlist for that, um, uh, to that VIP, and add those items to her MyHN section, ping an email out to her and say, personalized message saying, hope you love your dress, hope it fits great, these are the things you left behind. We're going to put them in your um, uh, my HN area. And it's, it's kind of not hard sell because you can't hard sell to these types of customers. You're just giving them an additional service. An extension of that, kind of working the other way, is the style advisors. So these guys, um, it's really important. It's something you try and create online. I think we've all seen many technologies in fashion and apparel that have tried to do outfit building. They've tried to create... Uh, a mannequin or some kind of visual where you add clothes on. And I, I, I don't know, any of you might have tried it out there. The experience has never been that great, partly because it doesn't represent actually your body shape, but also it just simply doesn't quite work. You don't have that personal touch. So for Harvey Nichols, style advisors are massively important because of their fashion knowledge. They're able to match products with other products. So one of our challenges uh, or advantages of a multi-channel operation that, that, that pure plays can't do is encourage that transaction in store, is to encourage that visit and that one-to-one -one relationship. You start to build up a much deeper profile, not just based on data, but are based on that person's emotions, their needs, and their personality. So CRM is crucial to all this. Um, you know, with a, with a mail order head-on, I'd look at CRM and say it's one of the most misunderstood and almost mismarketed tools that we currently have at our disposal, too much of it still focuses on this RFM model, this recency, the frequency, and the monetary value. It's really backward looking. It tells you a number of things that, okay, this person's done this, and you make some assumptions what they're gonna do next. If you're a young mother, and you go into uh, a store or a supermarket and buy some diapers one week, and then you go and buy diapers the next week, I can make a pretty good call that you're a new mother, right? And I know then for two years, I pretty know much your life cycle of the purchasing you're gonna do. Because if you're a parent, those two first two years are pretty much mapped out. So my CRM strategy can kick in just like that. If I go and buy a 5,000 pound Alexander McQueen dress, it doesn't tell me a lot about what you're gonna buy next. It tells me a lot about the money and the particular brand you like. But if you're in a multi-brand environment where you're selling 800 brands, I need a lot more information to be able to market you on your next purchase. There's not enough in your purchase that allows me to do that. So what we're trying to do is collect more information, encourage more people to come in store. And we've taken click and collect one step further with click and try. Now, click and try is exactly what it says it is. You go through a very similar user journey on the website. But the difference here is you're going to come into store to collect the item, but you're going to be met by someone, you're going to try that item on, and you'll be able to assess the size and fit. Why is this crucial for fashion and certainly high-end fashion? 
Well, because the biggest problem we face is returns, right? So returns rate can be pretty high, let's say around 30%. You, don't want, you want to minimize that cost to the business. And again, when you've got lower stock, you want to minimize that stock movement around the country. Because as soon as that dress has been dispatched, it can't be sold anywhere else, and it needs to be. So click and try. The customer selects the option. They get an email from uh, confirmation. When the goods arrive, they get an appointment booked by the style advisor to control demand and funnel it through the store. And then they come into the store. Now, we have a very good advantage here is that we can then say, because of the knowledge we have, that item, i.e. that dress, can be matched with these other items. So the good style advisor will take those items and take them and style it with the person who comes. It's a classic upsell moment. You're giving them something they weren't expecting when they arrive. It's probably the, the, the innovation we're most excited about. So if you look at a more standard channel, or kind of this, this in vogue at the moment, from a mobile point of view, we, we looked at the statistics and the analytics for, for Harvey Nichols. And as it stands, mobile usage regularly exceeds 50% of overall traffic um, for the site. So we couldn't ignore that. Of those users using mobile devices and tablets, 80% of them were iOS devices, as you'd expect for a luxury audience. So as part of the project, a tablet-compatible website and a mobile-specific theme was crucial. Obviously, with the mobile theme, there were key complexities around navigation and, um, and site merchandising. Harvey Nichols have a very large catalog for certain, um, certain different categories, um, and that makes it very challenging for the customer in terms of filtering, um, filtering through those categories. We also had to look at the way that we presented different types of product as well. So because Harvey Nichols is a department store, we were selling fine wine with women's fashion as well, which presented some challenges in terms of doing that. So to try and address some of those challenges, we looked at a mobile-specific experience. Rather than trying to take the desktop experience and make it the size of a mobile, what we looked at doing was curating products specifically for mobile and reducing some content that we didn't feel was of value to a standard user journey within a mobile context. So rather than, a, rather than using a responsive approach, we actually used an adaptive approach, which allowed us to create completely different experiences for customers between mobile and desktop, based on the feedback that we got about the number of products and the difficulty that the customers had in terms of finding what they needed to. And actually, because we wanted to create a different experience, because people are doing different journeys on a mobile to what they are on a desktop or on a tablet. Um, we, also in, we also put in some other functionality to help, eat, help customers go through the checkout process faster, such as tokenization of payments. Look, I, I, can I add something on here? I think because it's been talked about a lot over the last two days, the responsive versus adaptive approach. I don't think it's an either or. I think it kind of frames the decision completely in the wrong context. So when we talk about mobile strategy, we're actually saying, how does the mobile user interact with your website rather than what do I need to do for this mobile device? It's the wrong way around. The, the, the biggest thing that could help all of us as retailers for mobile is, is one-click payments. You know, all of our analytics show that people are very keen and will look at this website through uh, their mobile device if we prompt them via an email, as an example. But the, to get them to convert if you haven't got one click, if they're on the tube or they're on the train, it's not going to happen. Um, you're not going to get your credit card out to do that. So, so I think further down the funnel is that. The second part to it is if you've got 60-odd thousand SKUs and you've built this whole experience of desktop around faceted search and navigation and categorization to ensure that the right products get to the right people at the right time, suddenly that works pretty good in all of our desktop thinking of the last 10 years, doesn't it? But then we condense it to a mobile screen where to show luxury beautifully, you have got a single product flow. So our rules there about most clicks appearing higher, higher margin products, new in, et cetera, get really compromised because using filters and facets is really hard. There's no solution to this at the moment because, again, it's pretty nascent. But I think that's the option that we took, um, and time will tell whether it's been the right one. We also took that a little bit further in terms of acknowledging places where actually mobile wasn't relevant, where we actually didn't need to create a mobile experience just because one existed on the desktop. So a good example of that is the Christmas hampers, uh, which are relatively famous in, in the UK. Harvey Nichols allows you to check out with five, six, seven, however many hampers you want, dispatch them to different friends, family, family and colleagues, to different addresses at different times on different days. Now, 
from a user's point of view, that's quite a complex process even on a desktop to be able to give that much information. So actually we made the very deliberate decision that we wouldn't try to create that experience on a mobile. And actually we felt that the user experience would be better by directing them to someone in store or on, or on the, the customer services team to be able to complete their order. So I, so I think, just to, just to reiterate the point, what we were doing here was, was trying to actually give the customer the experience that they expected rather than just giving them a reproduced experience from elsewhere when we knew they weren't going to use that functionality on mobile. Here's introducing an odd concept for you, something that we call non-Intel. I should have got the marketing guys on that to call it something a little bit more exciting. Um, so again, going back to my point about brand relationships, one of the trends over the last five years uh, is the amount of luxury brands in particular who started to sell their own products direct to consumer. Uh, actually, m many of, uh, of the big ones on Magento. Um, that creates some challenges, actually, because that allows them to control, again, their brand perception online, how they present product, how they photograph product, et cetera. And they're starting to push that back down the funnel and saying, guys, if you want to sell our products just the same way as you do in store with concessions, you've got to meet these certain criteria. And it's absolutely their right to do so. So you have this kind of challenge between your own brand and what those brand expectations are. So in this instance, we've got a brand that said, we've no problem with you showcasing our, our products online, but we, we don't want you to purchase them online and deliver them via home delivery. Okay, so what they've said though, but we will accept selling it online to be tried in store or collected from the store. Why? Because then they have more control over the experience at the point of delivery and the point of um, handing over the product. It kind of feels kind of anathema to what you want to do as an e-commerce operation, but in luxury it feels okay. Um, and what we've done here is essentially use that personal shopping concept a little bit more. And as soon as someone adds this product to basket, the only options they have from delivery are click to try, click and collect. Now they can choose to say, don't want that, et cetera, or they can go. In an extreme version of this, there are some brands that only allow you to call the call center. So you pick up the phone number and you can order it and still have it delivered in the normal way. So again, it's about the perception that, that brand wants to portray online and how you want to do this. And we achieved this pretty simply. We created a different product attribute in the feed that said this is non-ETL, and we display a different product template page when those products are fed through from the feed. Yeah, content merchandising. So this is a, a concept that I'm, I'm trying to patent, but I'm getting not, not particularly well about it. Content, content, content. So we create so much of it in the luxury sector. And I'm sure any of the retailers in here, you have those pressures on creating content. Now, a few years ago, we were doing this mainly so that we could get more higher listings on, on Google. But you know, the cost of entry for us to produce really good content now is, is, is much lower. So what we're looking at here is, how do we treat content like we treat product? If you go on the Harvey Nichols website, you're confronted with your usual scrolling carousel, and underneath that is a Pinterest-style approach to content. It's an ever-ending flow of articles, of features, of events, etc. How do you control that? So what we've done is we've fed that through the Fred Hopper tool, which is the search and merchandising tool. And we can apply the same rules to content as we can to, sorry, to product as we can to content, which is most clicks goes higher up. We can apply newness, we can apply categorization, so we can start to have content changing on the fly and not having to worry about our CMS dealing with that. We can also field that, that content and tag that content through to the product pages and the category pages. When the article about Alexander McQueen is written, of course, it will appear on all of those Alexander McQueen pages. Anything that's relevant to that brand suddenly merchandises really well. And it's working really nicely for us. So just to briefly touch on the, the, the tech that we've had to build to, to enable all those things, as, as Gavin said, we've got a lot of complex data requirements around product and content working together. So I've already thought about the adaptive mobile theme and why we decided to do it that way. Um, we're also working with Rackspace on hybrid hosting during sale periods. Um, Harvey Nichols see dramatic increases in, in traffic of 10, 20 times a normal day. Um, so they're able to scale into the cloud on demand when, they, when, when required. We're obviously making use of full page cache um, functionality in Magento Enterprise. We're also, we're also using um, Backbone for progressive enhancement of pages and to serve assets to customers quicker. Um, and we're using Akamizer CDN for static content uh, such as um, JS files, CSS, and, and imagery. Um, and as Gavin already said, we're using Fred Hopper both for content and product, which gives the Harvey Nichols team much more control over merchandising, not only of product, 
but also of content as well. So, so to recap, there's, there's a number of examples there that we've, we've, we've used in this, this process that we've done in this multi-channel development. T going back to, to Magento and how it deals with this complexity, again, I'll kind of reiterate the point. What do we want from our e-commerce engine? And this kind of echoes what we heard about 2.0 yesterday, and I think that's the next benchmark for us, is we want our e-commerce engine to be a pretty light layer, as far as we're concerned, that can handle complex integrations that an enterprise business has. We don't need it to do order management. We don't need it to do product and search merchandising. We would need a damn fine promotions engine, and we need something robust and scalable. And that's kind of where our vision is for this. It's as light as touch as possible, and we'll do the complexity outside. So the quality of those integrations are absolutely critical. <clears throat> so that's pretty much all we had to say, because we wanted to open up the floor for Q&As. But there, there, there are a number of things. I, I think this is kind of my personal experience of the last two years, where very good healthcare in the UK has got me through an extraordinary project. Um, <laughs> customers, not technology. So this is the bit where this feels like marketing speed, but it really isn't. You've got to flip it around, because if you're gonna, when you get into really complex build processes, that technology bit takes over. It's inevitable because you're working with a lot, a lot of limitations and a lot of challenges, and never lose sight of that. It's much easier to frame discussions around requirements when you're working with what the customer's asked you for rather than what the platform can or can't do. And that's, that's helped us to, to get to where we are. Mm -hmm. This ever-changing requirements thing is important. It's, Look, it's the job of salespeople to sell us a dream, and it's the job of us to control our expenditure and buy the dreams that are relevant to us, right? And I think that the, the thing that we have at the moment in such a fast pace, such a fast moving thing, uh, sector is that the quality of our decision making needs to be really good. And having the courage to say, because this person over here is doing it, and it's giving them a perceived competitive advantage, you say, I'm not ready for that yet, but I will get to it, because what I need to focus on is what I need to achieve today. The agency fit was crucial, certainly when you're starting at this, and that's including our development partner, plus our search and merchandising partners, all the partners in the project. They built into that first point. That's what we, we were choosing them on. I didn't want to get into a situation where down the road it was a RFP that sounded great, and then, oh, sorry, we can't do half of that because that's just not possible. So it's crucial for us, their ability to be flexible and adaptable. Device strategy, we have to come back to this, and I, I put this in because of the conversations over the last uh, couple of days. It, it, it's the responsive thing. It's really cool when I see someone resizing a browser, and all that's really neat. It kind of doesn't solve any of our problems as retailers into what is our mobile strategy. How do we look at that user and say, what does he do in store? You know, I've had lots of conversations, quite heated ones, actually, about what works and what doesn't. Let's remember the consumer has more information than we do now. And that's, that's a crazy place to be. So that person who walks in store has essentially got the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in their hand, and yet the people greeting them in store are very often the least paid in the business. That's the reality. So how do you kind of bridge that gap? And it never ends. I wish it did. So I wish we could put a moratorium on development and a moratorium on innovation for two years just so we could all catch up and take a breath, but we can't. It just never ends. So as soon as you launch, that's an artificial date, isn't it? Any kind of development is an artificial date. It's always on to the next thing. The things that we're showing you today have been accomplished. It's about refining them, and we've got some really exciting stuff coming up in the next six months. <laughs>